Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, time for something a little different. I decided that I needed a YouTube subscriber counter, but I didn't want to write a whole episode centered around writing a YouTube subscriber counter. And I decided the easiest thing to do would just be write it, record me doing it, edit it, post it, and see how that goes. So bear with me and we'll see how it goes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with an old project that you may have seen on the channel if you've been around for a long time, like two years or so. Uh, the Mesmerizer, which is a 32 by 64 RGB matrix panel that can display full color. I'm going to use that panel to display the subscriber count, and I'm going to use an ESP32 chip to connect to the internet, post the REST request off to the Google API, get the data back from the Google API, and display it in text on the RGB matrix panel. So I've got a bunch of drawing code already in the background written to handle effects because it's kind of a little display panel that I use for various kind of cool effects, RGB effects. So it's already got drawing and text and all that kind of things. All I need to do is pull it all together. There's also an API called the YouTube Site API. So part of the problem with the uh, Google API is that you need to log in and authorize your browser and so on, and I can't do that from an RGB matrix panel. So I'm going through an intermediary website called YouTube Site that allows you to get a GUID that, or GUID if you prefer, that comes back from their service and you query that GUID and you can then get your subscriber count and other information through them as an intermediary. Of course, you're revealing that information to them and giving them some access to your YouTube metrics, but oh well. Now, I've set up a number of different cameras. I have my main episode camera that I usually use here, although I'm not recording in uh, any fancy mode, so it might not look the same in terms of color grading and so on. I've got a camera over here, which is focused on the little RGB matrix panel, um, just a Logitech desktop camera that allows me to get sort of the big, big room perspective here. So now you can see behind the scenes sort of what's going on when I'm recording. Uh, this is just another angle. Here's all my windows back here, my little plaques, uh, Corolla robots in there. It's actually pretty straightforward to add a new visual effect to my Mesmerizer project. You simply create a class that derives from the drawable object, and, or drawable class, I should say. And from there, once you put it in the right table, it's magic. All right, stop talking and start chucking. Let's write some code. I have two external variables that are already set, and I'll actually go through the code on how they're set, um, but they are the ones that pull the data from YouTube and then just set these global counts of the number of subscribers and views so that any of the effects can uh, reference them. So this is my drawable base class. You can see that it's its draw does some timing, asks how many milliseconds you want before the next frame, some niceties like that. But largely, it's just calling you to do all the drawing. Before we implement anybody, I need two variables. No, I just need one. A string for my uh, title. If I'm lucky, this will build skeletally and do nothing. But it should compile. Well, when you spell things properly, you have a better chance of compiling. What else? So I've put my single pattern, my pattern subscribers, which will draw my uh, subscriber count, as the one and only pattern to be in this entire machine right now. So. There are many other effects that I could uh, draw, but then step through them with a remote and so on, but we'll keep things simple for now, which is the one, and I'm kind of at a loss as to why this thing is not building. That's really painful. When you forget the semicolon and it gives you a misleading error like that, you can spend some time chasing that. And I did. All right, let's upload this, and nothing should happen. It should just draw a blank, and we'll start with a blank canvas. All right, we've got a blank RGB matrix display. Uh, check the serial monitor here to make sure nothing is crashing. 
Okay, power 80k memory free, connecting to Wi-Fi. It's got an IP address, so it's up and running. Now, at a minimum, we should be able to draw and render into this thing and just fill it with blue. Well, it's kind of an off blue, but let's uh, just try that really quick to make sure things are working. I wish it linked faster. All right, we got a blue screen. I just want to see what this looks like. Upload. So it really takes its time on this ESP32 to latch and connect and do the actual upload. I'm not sure why. Yeah, it doesn't really look like a blue screen, but that's worth one more try. Do, 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 do. All right, enough with my fake Windows blue screens. Let's actually put some information on this thing, like uh, how many subscribers I might actually have and that kind of thing. All right, we got the border, we got the background, we got Dave's Garage as the title. Now, I'm okay with left justifying the title because it's generally gonna be pretty long anyway, but the subscriber count will vary in size depending on how many digits you have. Unfortunately, there's no get text extent on these layer objects that I can call in order to find the actual size. So, what I'm going to do is start in the middle and then back up for every so I can't do log 10. I know what I'm going to do. Bear with me. So here's where the magic happens, and it's not that magical after all. But all I'm doing is, as long as there is another digit left that I can divide by 10 for, I am going to back up one half of a character width, which should center a long number. You could do it without the loop if you could call log 10 and then just forget how many digits there were in the number, but then that's probably way more expensive, so I'm not going to do that. Highly dangerous and dubious code here that takes no account of how big the buffer is. It's just going to print into it and hope for the best. Instead of just drawing the count, I'm going to draw a black version of the count, up left one, up right one, up one, and so on, so that I get a, not a drop shadow, but a glow around my font. Now I'm about to do Y minus one and Y plus two. If you think you know why that is, let me know in the comments. Now, if I'm not mistaken, that should be all the combinations of different directions. And you'll notice the final one prints it in white in the middle. Let's see how this looks, where I'm at. Well, I think that looks pretty close to exactly what I wanted. Black fringe is around the entire thing. 
If we wait a minute, we might get lucky and it'll catch the update. I'll give it a minute. Gonna get the Uco Day. Here we go. 78,697 subscribers. If you don't feel included in that number because you're not a subscriber, click the button, man. Classic content like this, how can you go wrong? All right, except how is this magical G subscribers variable being set? You think I'm just gonna let that one go and just let that one just be a mystery? Nah, let's find all references to this and I'll show you how it's figured out. So first of all, I've got a volatile long, which is G subscribers or GC subscribers. And the reason it's volatile is, and I'm not 100% sure on this, because I'm not sure how the ESP32 works for CPU synchronization, but I was having problems with it being out of sync between cores. So once I marked it as volatile, uh, the code then got an understanding that hey, the other core could change the value from underneath me and I can't keep a cached version in a register and so on. So that's what the volatile keyword actually means, by the way. If you're not used to that in C, it basically means somebody else could change this value other than the code. So a machine, uh, interface, hardware, an interrupt, anything that could change the value without the code knowing about it and the compiler's uh, version of what's going on, that should be marked volatile. So this is in my loop, which for an ESP32 Arduino style app is you first have a setup call, which does any initialization, and then a loop call, which is called repeatedly forever. And I'm going to, inside that loop, gonna check, are we connected to Wi-Fi? And if we are, I'm going to figure out, this is by the way static, which means it's not going to get reset every time. It's just going to be set to millis the first time and then incremented each time that I actually call into the YouTube API. So if the current time is greater than the projected next runtime, we debug print that we're going to fetch the data. We're going to turn the debug flag on because that's what allowed me to see what's going on in terms of fetching the actual data from the API. I then use this magical site object that we'll get to in a second, and I just call get data on it. It goes and fills out its own information, which is basically channel stats. And that has things like subscriber count. So as you can see, I'm just storing that into the global subscriber count. So all I've done is kind of pass the buck here and say, well, magically YouTube site does it. Well, let's go look at the YouTube site object. So in its implementation file, we'll go take a look at its get data. All it's doing is opening up a really simple HTTP connection to a web service that takes a simple get call, which in this case is API, YouTube site, and then my GUID, which I probably showed you and I shouldn't have done, so I'll have to make sure I blur that out if I've already scrolled past that. Oh man, now I'm gonna have to look for that. All right, so we connect, well, we don't, it does. It connects to the uh, URL. It's gonna pull the data out, get the headers, skip past the headers. So if the body is non-blank in the request response, it goes through and it parses out how many views, subscribers gained, subscribers lost, uh, current count, minutes watched, and total view duration. And that is it. In order to include and use that functionality, you simply add the YouTube site Arduino library to your project, library, yes, I did say with the R, uh, include the header file, declare one instance of the object, YouTube site, and call site get data. And that's it, that's all. Well, there you go. Now you know roughly how a YouTube subscriber counter can be built for a couple bucks, because these things are about 20 bucks for the RGB LED and about 10 bucks at most for the ESP panel. So it's like 30 bucks. And if you try to buy a YouTube subscriber counter online, they're like 200 bucks. So good economy if you need to know your subscriber count and you just want to have a sign sitting there to remind you at all times how many subscribers you have. So if you don't catch yourself among them, please be sure to subscribe. And in the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Yogi, you scared me. All right, we got the border, we got the background, we got Dave's Garage as the title.